So will the ushers please come forward? <laughs> if there ever was a good time to do it, it would be after Beasley has finished lighting up the stage. What an exciting experience it is to be here with you. I want to say thanks, not only for coming, thanks for being very patient for me the opportunity to come. I know, quite frankly, when you're the last person in the program, you should do what Jesus would have said in the New Testament had he ever been the last guy on the program. He would have added this to the Beatitudes. Blessed are the brief, for they shall be invited again. <laughs> Unfortunately, as most of you know, my uh, life before politics was that of a pastor, and then I got into politics. So you know what that means. You're going to be here a while. <laughs> and I made an issue come on. I don't know. That didn't get much of a laugh. You guys are really Now, I'm not going to ask you for money. You will be here a while, I'm pretty sure. I'm not uh, going to try to wear you out, but I, I want to say how much of an honor it is for you to come to see this kind of enthusiastic group of people who care about their country, care about its future. And I'm uh, overwhelmed with the opportunity to be on the same stage as my friend David Beasley, and before him, one of the great Americans I've ever known, Cleve McClary. I first heard Cleve McClary. I told him this story when I was a teenager. And he came to my church in Arkansas and he shared his story. And there was there were things that he said that day, and I was probably 16 years old, and I still remember after all these many years. And it's rare that you hear a speaker that you even remember hearing. It's especially rare when you actually remember something he said. And you so take it to heart that you can still quote it 30 years later. And one of the things that I'll never forget that Cleveland Clary said, Cleveland, if you said it tonight, then I'll just be repeating it. If you didn't, you should have. You should have said this because it's something I remember after all these years. But he made a statement. He said, I've never lost at anything I've ever done. He said, sometimes the game finishes before I get finished playing, but I've never lost at anything I've ever done. What a great testament to perseverance, to not giving up. Because one of the easiest things in the world is just to decide you're not going to answer the bell for the next round. America is not a great country because people gave up. It's not a great country because people ever decided they would just give it in. It's a great country because people were willing to keep answering the bell no matter what the odds were. Every year around the 4th of July, we celebrate our nation's independence. We kind of go back and revisit that magnificent document document that we call the Declaration of Independence, signed by 56 incredibly brave Americans who knew they were putting more than their signatures on a piece of paper. They fully understood that when they wrote their names on that document that said that we're going to break away from our mother country, they knew that if this experiment and this new type of government didn't work out, they weren't just going to lose the business. It wasn't just their taxes would go up. They were going to die. They would pay with their own blood, and so would their families. They fully understood the consequences of declaring an essence war against a nation that was better equipped, better financed, better trained, had an unlimited capacity for military might. And here they were, the farmers, basically beating their plows into weapons. An incredibly audacious thing to think that they could win. I'm not sure that they thought about whether they could win or not, but they knew that they had to be free. And it was out of that kind of spirit that Patrick Henry said, give me liberty, or give me death. And quite frankly, those were his choices. He would either get liberty or he'd die. And he fully understood that. Today, we are the recipients of the incredible courage men and women who through these years of our history have had that spirit. That it was an all or nothing. And that they never thought about it being so much for themselves as they did to make sure that the next generation is able to live better and free than they ever could. Every one of us here tonight are here because somebody paid a huge price for us to be free. The generations that will come after us, they'll have to look back and decide whether or not we had the same kind of courage and commitment to 
make them free as our parents did to make us free. Our parents' generation are also called the, uh, the greatest generation. And the reason we call them that is because these are the people that went through the Great Depression and a World War, and instead of becoming angry, bitter, cynical, giving up, they just became more determined that their kids would have a better life than they ever did. If there's anybody in this room who truly could say that he's the product of the American dream, I'd be the first to try to claim that I understand a little bit about that. Many of you would say the same thing, but my parents lived through the Depression. Sometimes growing up, I thought I had two because they kept telling me about it. <laughs> I swear there were days, I, I'm pretty sure they, they marched every day uphill to school both ways. <laughs> I'll hear Colonel all the stories about carrying their lunch in a surf bucket, whatever that means. Now they walk through snow to get to school. We didn't have snow in Arkansas. And I, walk through snow. <laughs> I don't know what kind of fantasy journey they had when they got older and looked back. They told us about that anyway. And then they had gone through the experience of their country being at war. They came out of that experience with an attitude that said, my kids will have a better than this. For my parents, there was a lot to overcome. My father never graduated high school. In fact, as I looked all the way up the family tree, as far as we could look, and my dad told me, son, don't look too far up that tree. There's stuff up there you just don't need to see. <laughs> but what I can tell you is that there was no male upstream from me in my family lineage who had ever even graduated from high school, much less from high college. And on my mother's side of the family, I am one generation away from dirt floors and outdoor toilets. My mother grew up with just that. They wanted to escape that. They wanted my sister and me to escape that. And they were willing to do just about anything so that we could. So we didn't have a lot when I was a kid, but one thing we had, we had discipline. We had a sense of firmness about what we were going to do. We were going to go to school. We were going to finish. We were going to behave. We were going to make good grades. It wasn't an option. That was an absolute. I tell people, I grew up in an extraordinarily patriotic household. Let me explain what my... Dad meant by patriotism. He laid on the stripes, I saw the stars. <laughs> That's as old fashioned a patriotism as anybody's ever experienced. It kept me straight. I know there were people say, well, that wasn't very nice of him. Well, I, yeah, I look back, even my parents were always disciplined me with the thing of, this is going to hurt me worse than this is going to hurt you. <laughs> I didn't believe that then. <laughs> So I don't believe it now either. I still never think it hurt me worse. But they did it because they loved me. They did it because they wanted for me to not ruin the chances that I had. And they knew that the chances I had were tied directly to the fact that I lived in the United States of America, where in this nation anything is possible. My dad was one of those guys who was a firefighter for the city of Hope, Arkansas. He worked as a mechanic on his days off from the fire department because there wasn't enough money as a fireman to be able to pay the bills and pay even the rent on the little rent house that we lived in on 2nd Street in Hope Park. So. True, when I was a kid growing up, the only soap we had in our house was lava soap. Most of you don't even know what that means, but for those a little older, here's what it means. I was in college before I found out it's not supposed to hurt when you take a shower. <laughs> Some of you, for your wives or other special people in your life, you got them a certificate to the spa so they could have an exfoliation. <laughs> hey, look, a bar of lava will give you the same thing. <laughs> My dad only knew one thing, and that was hard work. Back-breaking hard work. He wanted me to somehow find something different. So what did his son do? He became a politician, and believe me, it's mostly indoor work, and there is no heavy lifting in this job. So. <laughs> We live in a world that is threatened every single day. And that American dream is threatened. On this very day, as we sit here in our halfway around the world in a country I visited just less than two years ago, Pakistan, former Prime Minister Buto, tragically assassinated. We don't know you. But we're pretty sure we understand why. Because she represented something that was a real threat the kind of radical, Islamic, fundamentalist jihadism 